Welcome to the Real Estate PB&J Hour on Money Talk 1310 and 100.9 FM. Rose and Womble realtor Paul Fuquay is here to share market facts, the fundamentals of selling, buying, owning, and improving your home, plus interesting experts. Now, here is Paul. Uh, good afternoon, folks. This is Paul Fuquay. Uh, welcome to the Real Estate PB&J Hour. Uh, where we discuss the elements of home selling, buying, maintenance of your property, uh, and its improvement, especially as it pertains to the markability of it when you subsequently want to sell. Um, our purpose is to share this information, the news and advice and experiences we have uh, with myself and my guests and co-hosts, um, to help you make whatever sound decisions you wish to make on uh, one of the biggest investments conceivably one of the biggest investments you'll ever make uh, in your life, and that's your home, and maybe subsequent second or third or fourth or fifth home. I'm Paul Fuqua. I'm a full-time uh, professional realtor. Uh, I'm affiliated with Rosenwomble Realty, and I've been lucky enough over the years to help hundreds of buyers, sellers, and investors in Hampton Roads uh, find the right house or sell the wrong house. Um, my co-host today are Kim Pimento, also Hello, at Rosenwommel. And you've helped me sell a few of those houses. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. my good friend is back, uh, Bob Freck. Uh, we, we haven't made our way past page four of the contract, so that's why he's here, uh, because his detail consciousness, uh, having been a backseat pilot, um, in F-14s is astounding. And telling the pilot which way to turn and giving the pilot so they yeah. don't get lost. Yeah, I I'm kind of here to keep you on track, Paul. Yeah, right, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, at our last show, we got through the first half of page eight of the sales contract. And there, again, 15 pages. That's not including all the addenda that have to be appended to any sales contract. We'll be getting into that stuff in a little bit. And if you get bored, you can always turn us off or change to another channel. That reminds me, we are at Money Talk 1310 AM, 100.9 FM. And if you're at a computer, switch over to moneytalk1310.com. Um, or, or if they get bored, they can call in uh, and ask hey, us a question that we can't hey, answer. Right? You're, you're, uh, <laughs> hey, listen, if Paul. we don't know the answer, we're going to lie. <laughs> it's that simple. But the phone number here is 757-497-1310. 757-497-1310. And what I'm trying to foster in this uh, gathering every week is a little bit of collegiality and a lot of being at the bar next Hold my beer while I make a discussion, this, this discussion. It's all about the fundamentals of, of buying and selling your house. And if you wish, you can call me direct at 757-449-7463. Um, it, it, that's my private line, and I don't take calls while I'm on the air. I have to turn the phone off because it disturbs the airwaves. But as we did last week and the week before, this show is going to be uh, structured very loosely. Uh, we want, uh, I want uh, both Kim and Bob, because of their l years of experience, to be able to chime in and correct anything that I may, uh, any mistakes I may make. And we want to foster as much discussion of issues that you may run into as a buyer or a seller of your real estate, your home, your apartment, your condo, your second home, whatever, uh, lot, land that you have in Hickory or Pungo or Suffolk or the county, um, there are issues that can come up in the process of uh, buying or selling houses. And, that, and that's a good point, because also with, with the experience we have sitting here, we've run into a lot of situations where we're able to help our, whether it's the buyer or seller, when they're constructing the offer, if you're on the buyer side, if you're responding to an offer on the seller side, how to make sure the wording is correct, not only to get your, as a buyer, get your offer to to basically come up to the top and be the number one offers on the table, right. um, how to prevent pitfalls pitfalls that, are, that will drop you to number two. You have a story for us later on. I that. got a story okay. for us later Let, on, on that. Uh, yes. we wanna, that's the meat of the program. This is the lead-in. 
<laughs> Meet the program to make decisions. Yeah, it, exactly. Uh, now, one of the things we always do is we run down uh, the statistics, and they're boring, um, but they are important. And one of the functions that Kim uh, performs for this show is a report, and it's going to be really relatively quick because you can fall asleep listening to numbers. But the pattern continues in our area. We've seen a softening. We've seen uh, the entire price range in June has fallen just under the ratio of 101% of list price. It, it, it was 102%. Yes, 102. Uh, and we're also in that summer lull that uh, is not as pronounced but is there that we've experienced historically year after year after year. People don't buy houses on July 4th. They might buy them on the 6th, 7th, or 8th or sometime later, but... Historically, July has been a vacation month, and you don't see as much traffic. Or they'll pick up. We see it pick up often, and probably across the country. As you start approaching August, and yep. and buyers who have school age children trying to get into houses before the school year starts, and then of course that varies. So you'll see it pick up uh, for very military moves, right? And and. Permanent change of station, PCS moves, and when the government funds those moves can really affect our the curve we have on, on sales in Hampton Roads. All right, let's let's go. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think that people are starting to move around. But however, yeah, Kim, just to give let us y'all a, know a rundown on what the what the rates are and what uh, the, the how the numbers work. It's, okay, well, I'll tell you yours. one thing. Just being the broker, I go through all the contracts that come in, and actually, this uh, July weekend was pretty busy. Was it really? It was busy. Oh my! Yeah, we had That's listings surprising. that came on and uh, some. Well, I sales. sold one this, and Bob sold one this weekend. Yeah, it was you know? a good July Fourth. I think um, I, I was kind of proud of everybody getting out there. I think the weather was beautiful, and people were out. Uh, <laughs> people buy. Yeah. They want to buy a house that's got better air conditioning than the one they have, they're living in now. I think. <laughs> Yeah, you have to be decisive, right or wrong, make yep. a decision. The road of life is paved with flat squirrels who couldn't make a decision. <laughs> How many times have you been a squirrel in traffic the way I have? <laughs> I, I got to write that one down. That was a pretty good. One. Would you repeat that? That's a good. That that's right out of Texas. Yeah, that is. My dad sent me this. Be decisive, right or wrong, make a decision. The road of life is paved with flat squirrels who couldn't make a decision. <laughs> People, I'm sorry, I gotta laugh at that one. That's that's well all right. done. That was worth the price of admission. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> Remember, this is uh, the real estate PB and J hour on Money Talk 1310 AM and 100.9 FM. Keep going, man. All right, so here we go. As reported last week, according to the National Association of Realtors, May 2022, May 2022's median existing home sales price of 407,600 represented a four point. 14.8% increase from one year ago. Month over month, sales fell in three of the four regions of the U.S. And year over year, sales were down in all four regions. This is first for the U.S. housing market. That The number is. It's the first time yeah. over 400,000. Right. So back here in Hampton Roads, which is where we live, which again is a pretty wide area, Hampton, Newport News, Suffolk, Portsmouth, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake. So that is a l very large area. There are today 4,053 active residential listings, of which 3,226 of them are, actually, are single family homes on the MLS, and 813 are attached homes, which meaning condos, co ops, townhouses, quads, and other attached dwellings, We're, meaning you share at least one wall. On the MLS today, last week our count was 3,970, and this week, th which is a 2% increase week to week. I wonder, is that the, do you think that's a consequence of being the end of the month? Yes, okay. I think I think the end of the month, and um, you know, it, it's his. What I think single family homes kind of like lead, lead the trend, and then right. here comes the, the 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 attached, and then here comes commercial. So right. we're kind of think it. Well, and you think also since the imin it's you know basically what we said is the inventory has gone up a bit, correct? Right, and stuff. So. A combination of sellers two percent, which is really small. It's small, but when you look at the overall picture of the last few years and stuff, um, inventory has stayed low. So you've got one of the things we've talked about on some of the past shows is the interest rate, and I know Kim's going to uh, uh, address that. And and a really good example of what the interest rate has done over uh, fr from a year ago to now 
and how it's affected the mortgage payment, the monthly mortgage payment for a buyer. So some of those buyers that might have still been in the market to buy have had to take a back seat because they Either don't that qualify buyer, or can't afford. they've had to take a back seat or they've had to adjust their price point lower. Yes. And which has meant that in lower price points where it's more critical, we've seen the, the fastest, um, the largest amount, blah, 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 largest amount of dropped prices, reduced prices. Correct. That's where it's the up, adjustments um, happen. Right, which, which means buyers are having to adjust their mindset yep. uh, to to maybe it's a smaller house, maybe it's a slightly different location, and if they're not willing to make that adjustment, you're going to start seeing the numbers start to change right. as we see these interest rates staying. What, you know what 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 folks nowadays consider high. You know we grew up in a in an era where you know if you got ten percent on a mortgage interest rate, you were uh, you were like a pig in mud. I mean, you were feeling good. <laughs> okay. And so, at, at what 10%. are the rates? Let's get, yeah, let's get, yes. Kim, give us, now these rates, remember, are volatile. They change daily. These are the rates quoted today. Yep, today. I got this hot off the press before I left the office today, about 420. So non-conforming, which means, folks, that that's a jumbo loan. With 10 months of reserves con- required on a non-conforming loan. And remember, all of these are based on a 740 credit score. All right? So a non-conforming jumbo loan with 10 months reserves, your interest rate would be 4.875%, which is actually a little lower. Yes. It's actually better. Conforming 30-year, no reserves required, which means it's not a jumbo loan, is a 6% with one point. Okay. So conforming investment... With 25% down payment and 10 months reserves required most of the time in investment properties, you get a 6% with 2.75 points. That's a big change for investment. That's a big thing. That's a 1.75 increase in points. So, Kim, tell me what you mean by reserves. Well, you, you've mentioned reserves a couple times, a 10-month reserve. What, what does that really mean? That means somewhere in your repertoire of accounts and savings you have 10 months to be able to pay that mortgage and your expenses for 10 months if you have a fifteen hundred dollar p and i you've got to have fifteen thousand dollars in cash in reserve after you You close 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 after you after your down payment your closing costs and stuff they're going to look and see if you've got that fifteen thousand dollars still sitting there now, you know, my question is, expenses. if if you have a 401k or if you have a pension fund or you have holdings in uh, a, a retirement plan, does that constitute part of that? Yes, 401k okay. for sure does. I yeah. think, it, you know, I, it's bonds, maybe not, because they're probably locked down a little right. bit longer, except that they were short term. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And what about, what about FHA and VA? How are they doing? You know, surprisingly, FHA and VA, you don't have to have any reserves because, right. you know, they are government-backed or government-insured with FHA. So at FHA right now is 5.625 with one point, mm-hmm. and a VA is 5.5% with one point. And, again, that's a 740 credit score. Okay. Uh, so let's go. Yeah. Let's, this oh, is the going. shocker. This is the shocker right here. So if you were in the market for a $250,000 house, $250,000 loan. $250,000 loan, right. You okay. could put a down payment. So if you borrowed $250,000, a few years ago, everybody was getting, what, the high twos, the low threes. Mm-hmm. At a 3%, your principal and interest would have been $1,054. $1,054. Yeah. Okay. $250,000 would have bought you a nice ca- condo, townhouse, right. you know, a little house somewhere, maybe in Portsmouth or out in Suffolk or, you know, even some parts of Chesapeake. Today... That same property, if you finance two hundred fifty thousand dollars, with the rates as they are today at five point five, your payment would be one thousand four hundred nineteen forty seven, and at five point seven five, one thousand four hundred fifty eight. That's almost a five hundred five hundred dollar um, increase per month, which that's a big chunk. Yep, it is for people who are in that price range, and, especially. Uh, and then, of course, it goes up. You know, of course, with the I don't know if you've seen it, but what I've seemed to have uh, seen when I was running through the MLS uh, yesterday and today is that the the concentration of 
price adjustments has been in the the slightly lower, not in the million dollar range or the two million dollar range or the seven hundred thousand dollar range. They're either priced correctly when they go on the market or they're adjusted very quickly. Right, and, and MLS being the multiple listing <coughs> yes. service that that realtors use, that's our data bank of houses. When you list your property, it goes into the multiple listing service that exposes your property to. All of the licensed realtors, real estate agents that have access to our multiple listing service, um, that's your exposure as a seller. All right. Now, do you have any more? Because we have an, about a minute before we have to take our commercial break. It goes fast in the show when we're talking to one another. <laughs> yeah, I know. It does go fast. But you know, I was just going to let you know this. This is some, uh, something that's interesting, the maximum seller concessions. So this means if you were a VA buyer and you finance 100%, the seller could actually pay all your closing costs plus 4%. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of... So you, you can know, retire back in the day, debt we used to see that things. happen. Mm-hmm. We used to see that happen. It's still possible. Yes, still but possible. It, it, and what some sellers have done is they've increased the price of the house in order to accommodate that, but then you have an appraisal issue. Okay, yes. we'll get to the, we'll, we want to get to the contract in a little while. Appraisal will be discussed slightly, uh, in fact, in depth. Uh, if you're listening to the Real Estate PB and J Hour and Money Talk 1310 AM and 100.9 FM, we'll be right back to discuss the sticking points of sales contracts. Now back to the Real Estate PB and J Hour on Money Talk 1310 and 100.9 FM. Rosenwamble Realtor Paul Fuquay gives you the fundamentals of real estate selling, buying, owning, and improving your home. Well, this is Paul Fuquay. Welcome back. You're listening to the Real Estate PB and J Hour on 1310 AM and 100.9 FM or MoneyTalk1310.com. Remember, if you have any questions for me or Kim or Bob, uh, or you want to pick an argument, we'll be more than happy to welcome that. Also, anything to get some liveliness and and get rid of the stench of statistics, uh, please call the station at 497-1310, 757-497-1310. And as always, you can subscribe and listen to past episodes. Of the the show, the Real Estate PB and J Hour, at your convenience on uh, my YouTube channel, the Real Estate PB and J Hour. Now, some of the questions that we've, the specific questions that we've addressed over the past two weeks, have been the following: In this market, should an offer be automatically uh, list price or more? Is the what's the importance of the description of the financing? What's the value of a larger money to, earnest money deposit? How is a loan? How should a loan approval letter be uh, phrased, how to state the down payment, what's the advantage to a seller of having an offer up from a cash buyer, what entity, what legal entity should be holding the earnest money deposit. And with the market changing and points being charged, closing cost assistance appears to be coming back. Yes, and and remember a point, uh, if you didn't catch it on one of the last shows, a point uh, is 1% of loan amount. So if, if you have a loan amount that's going to be $250,000, bucks. it's going to be $2,500 in addition to your closing cost, your, your we call them prepaid, things like homeowner's insurance, stuff like that, that you have to pay up front, and your down payment. So those points uh, can be a big chunk of change if you're not expecting that. Well, usually the, the lender... Will, when you make your first approach and you start going through the numbers, he will give you a good faith estimate. And in fact, when you finish it, your application processing, then they have to give you, and you have a, a property in mind, they have to give you a very binding good faith estimate. Correct. And if there is any variation by more than 10% of any of the elements particular to the loan, they have to restate that to you, and another three days has to pass for you to review it. So it's important that you get all this stuff nailed down as quickly as possible. Because the rubber meets the road when you make your first mortgage payment, uh, or you find out you don't qualify because you haven't got the reserves. You haven't. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into the into the numbers, and a good loan officer right. will help coach you through that and 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 show you what those numbers mean and how they vary. Now I'm going to ask Kim to uh, 
step up, take over this mic, because I'm going to ask a question, and then I'm going to let the discussion go between Bob and Kim. And the first one is, should there be a deadline set by a buyer in the offer when they give it to a seller uh, for his time to uh, respond? Should there be a limit? It, after 48 hours, this is withdrawn. or yeah, And how critical in that sense also is the settlement date to the validity of a or the strength of an offer go to it. I, I, yeah i think in a, in a lot of the issues that we've talked about on the show it there's depends. kind of two sides of the coin there, there's pros and cons to uh, putting restrictions uh and in in some cases you know if you let's say you were putting together an offer today on, on you were a buyer Okay, putting together an offer today on a property, and you know you've got all your offers set up, but you're considering, and you're talking to your agent about should we? We get this question very often as agents: should we put in a response time, like they need to respond within uh, 48 hours, or they need to respond? We often get that question, and. A lot depends. That's why we've asked it. Y- yes, yeah. and, and stuff. A lot depends on the property. The uh, you kind of sometimes have to look at your, your, your. In this market, it depends on how good your offer is. Yes, if and you have a really good offer, I think. Yeah, you want we want to be first one in, save the, your your client the sellers a lot of time and effort and trouble, but it has to be a pretty good offer. Yeah, because if because if it's not if it's not the number one offer that comes across the seller's table, they're going to go, well, okay, I'm going to wait. Yeah, we're just not going to bother responding because number one, their offer wasn't well written and wasn't the leading offer that came through the door. So that's it's a great question on whether or not you put that in and how it can affect the response from the seller. But again, if, if you go in with a, a poor offer, you, you know, can put whatever deadline you want in there, and the seller's just going to put it to the side and yeah. look at the other offers. Yeah, because at the end of the day, some sellers say, oh, well, you know, we just want a really nice offer, but, you know, those offers start coming in and the dollar signs start going Correct. off. And who, do, who wouldn't? I mean, I understand completely. Well, and, and a new listing. There's another one where, you know... It, it, in, it, when you have a new listing hit the market, your main activity in the market we've been used to the last few years, the first few days that that property hits the market, you're getting the majority of your showings, you're getting the majority or all of your offers coming in. And sometimes now, now flip the hat and you're the listing agent. And your seller looks at you and goes, well, gee... Um, I know we've got two or three or four offers. Um, why don't we wait for a couple more days and let's see what else comes through the front door? And What's the danger to a seller doing that? The seller is that people, the offers they have on the table are going to get irritated. Correct. Because if you, you know, if they know, okay, there's only, they know it's not as busy because you, you can pretty much go through a house as an agent as a, and as a buyer and know how busy it's been. Correct. And, and a buyer who's really put their best foot forward and, and written a really great offer on the house, on a house they want, and then they find out that the seller is just kind of hanging back and let's wait for some more offers. We, all of us here have seen buyers in that situation withdraw their offer and move on because they they, they they put an offer on the table that should be getting considered quickly. Uh, it's really important to realize that the contract that you've offered is not valid, is not enforceable, is not ratified until all provisions, including any changes, have been initialed by all parties. And as such, either party can withdraw his or her offer or counteroffer at any time until it's a ratified contract. Until it's so, accepted by the other. Accepted ratified. means that, okay, I make an offer to you for $200,000 on your house, mm-hmm. okay, and you can accept it as a seller, but you can also counter it back. Yep. You could counter my offer back. When you do that, you've basically rejected my offer, and you've come back with a new offer back to me as a buyer. So sometimes that can go back and forth two or three times. I've had it do. Uh, I've had occasion where it's been a seven or eight step because of the complexity of the yes. the purchase. 
at any point during that process, either party, seller or buyer, can withdraw from the process. Correct. There is no continuum in the negotiations. You either Correct. have a contract or you don't have a contract. Correct. There's no in between, folks. Correct. You can't say, well, we were talking, we had it all, we had the offer in and uh, you know, and they counter offered and da da. No. Correct. And so when you're writing the offer as the buyer and the buyer's agent, that's important to know because what you're trying to do is minimize, you're, you're trying to keep as many doors, uh, in a sense, closed that is going to prevent the seller. If you're going in with a really strong offer, you don't want to have these little uh, tidbits in your offer that causes the seller now to have to come back with a response, i.e., what we see very common is refrigerators, washers, and dryers, that the seller's willing to convey a good buyer's agent coming in the front door, if their buyers want those things, are going to put right up front in the offer that those things can convey as is. So the seller doesn't have to turn around and write that in a counter offer back, because meanwhile, while that counter offer comes back, a better offer comes through the door. Well, any good offer is going to reflect exactly what the sellers want in this market. So you, the agent needs to have called the other agent, talked to them about when they want to close. Do they need a rent back? What is what is the heart? What are, what are they looking for in an offer? And sometimes it's not always about the highest price. It's about closing date. It's about can I rent back? It's about I don't want to take down that above ground pool. You know, I don't want to take the swing set. So there's so many other things that can be important to a seller that you need to reflect exactly what the seller wants. And that's a good point is is, is a good buyer's agent not being a be afraid to pick the phone up and call the listing agent and say, and, and especially, and, and we've all dealt with it, and, and myself within the last month or two, is my sellers not wanting to close and depart the area until the school year was over. Because, you know, the, the kids are studying for exams and they're doing this and all this kind of stuff um, and everything. So sometimes a, a sharp buyer's agent comes in and asks those questions up front and now structures an offer with a settlement date that works good for the seller and now the seller doesn't have to come back at a counter offer and change it yeah well i, it, I think it it sometimes these discussions can be become the contract I mean, it, the, the, what we're talking about, folks, is that when you're 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 sitting there with your buyers, or you're sitting there with your clients, the sellers, and you are having a discussion about a potential offer or an offer that's going to come in, there's nothing that prevents you from following the the your client's instructions. You have to follow the client's instructions with regard to what constitutes an acceptable provision within the contract. Correct. Now, and we've got what we need to do is we really need to touch on the uh, what, how critical is that settlement date, and that I need you two to discuss that. And additionally, um, what inspections are absolutely, totally critical, and what's the difference between a home buyer's inspection and a walkthrough inspection? I know the answers, but a lot of people out there behind the wheel of the car and all this heat, they don't know the answer, so we're going to try and give it. Correct, and we, we touched on the, we touched on the, you know, putting a deadline in for a, a response. Right. Okay, we touched on the settlement date and sometimes getting that, getting on that phone and calling the listing agent for the seller and asking if they have a preferred settlement date. So that can be, that can be a very critical question and a very critical uh, part of your offer. Yeah, mo most people don't want to move twice, so most sellers right now if they're looking for a house to go or they're in a military and need to be like PCSing at the end of uh, July or August they'd want to stay in the house and PCSing being permanent change of station mm -hmm. so a lot of those things figure in with with you know moving and, and all this kind of stuff so um, I, I think both of those things can be critical depending on the situation yeah let's, sure let's touch Let's zero in on these inspections because that if ever there is a hindrance or an element of a sales contract or the process of buying or selling a home, inspections are the crux. They the more more deals and more disappointment occurs because of inspections than anything else. And the results of the inspections. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, correct. Well, first of all, the home inspection comes first. 
the walkthrough inspection comes at the end and actually it's designed to look to make sure that the home inspection items that were requested by the buyer have been done. And, and also that the house is in essentially the same condition that it was the last time the buyers come through. So, so it, that's a really good point. The walkthrough that comes sometimes a day of closing, sometimes a couple days before closing. Preferably a couple days. It, preferably, because if there's something that's not been finished or something like that, you've got a, a day or two built in there. But that walkthrough is really, really important and not something that should just be kind of ignored and go, oh, yeah, never mind, don't worry about the walkthrough. We just want to get in the house. Cause, yeah, you definitely you know, want to you, go you in. Want, and you know, today you come in and you turn the A.C. on. Yeah. And you make sure the AC is still working like it was back during the property inspection. And you can also bring your home inspector back, which is written to our um, our property inspection removal addendum, um, property inspection contingency addendum. You can bring your inspector back only to look at the items that he suggested need to be repaired and were agreed upon to be repaired. Correct. However, it, he can come back with you. And, and But he cannot do, a property inspector cannot come back and do the walkthrough for you. Guys, hold on a minute. We're talking about home buyers inspections when I'm seeing probably 50 to 60 percent of the contracts that we've received on listings. Uh, have home inspections for informational purposes only. <laughs> Nothing is for informational purposes only, but we'll I, we'll go with that. Okay. So well, when you when, explain that, yes, when well, you see it's that true in the because offer, it's almost, well, you see that in the offer. What's happening though is there everybody's putting that in. It's like a fi- it's like fishing. They they string that out there. The sellers grab on. Oh, great! Look at that. Information purposes only home inspection. You reel them in. You do the home inspection. Bam. Oh, well, we're gonna walk away unless you do this. And so or, then it opens up another can of worms. Correct. The other thing, and I just I just got through going through this not too long ago, was th- this phrase for informational purposes only. Sometimes is a, I hate to say this, but it's, it's kind of a game <laughs> to try to make your offer bubble up to the top. But when you look at the guts of the con of the offer of the property inspection contingency addendum, there's a whole bunch of get out of jail free cards tied in with that. So this for informational purposes only, unless there's s- extra terminology and wording to, to explain that you know the, there is uh and the thing is called a strike through and there is extensive language in the contract yes that has to be struck out correct with the in in my feeling with the exception of walk through items walk through items are systems of the house correct the doors have to operate as intended Windows have to open and close as intended. They are part of the system of the house. The HVAC, if it was operating and was noted, not noted as inoperable, then it has to operate. Well, and remember back in the old days, now, windows and doors operating are not itemized items on the walkthrough. And and the root, none of that stuff is item because the walkthrough is very clear on what is checked on it. Back in the old days, we used to put in to offers that windows and doors must be operating as intended and stuff like that. So unless that wording is in the offer and agreed to by the seller, if the windows aren't working when you get to walk through, unless it was a requested repair at the property inspection Wait agreed to. Hold on, hold on, let's back up. Yes. All right. Remember, I can't back up too far. I got a wall behind in, me. In today's market, we're saying that we're excluding where uh, there is going to be no property inspection contingency nor a contingency removal. There is no request to repair. However, there are and can be included language that that provides coverage for those items that are normally considered and have been noted in the inspector's report as walkthrough items. Are you talking about if you just don't have a property inspection? No. no. I, I, I'm, my, I, my advice to all of my buyer clients is we're going to have a home inspection. And there's one of your answers to the question you asked earlier on the importance of doing a, you'll hear it referred to sometimes as property inspection versus home. It's the same thing. All the same thing. But that's... that's due the, diligence. It's part of due diligence. Right. And it's the responsibility of the buyer to pursue all due diligence in determining the, the validity of the uh, property and its value and its structural integrity and it does it meet all the requirements they have. So for you home. would recommend if your buyer looked at you, Paul, and said, should we... Now, understand in popular property, uh, amazing location, they looked at you right. and said, 
What do you think? Should we ask for a property inspection or waive that? No, we are going to have a home inspection, but it's not going to be a contingency. It's going to be for our informational purpose only. It's going to, it will not be the nexus for a, a report uh, or rather a request for repairs with the exception of those elements that would be considered in common parlance as walkthrough items. Okay. If so, the air conditioning system is not working, we are, we know it now and we can tell the seller this is a walkthrough item. Well, correct. And walk through and, and we will walk expect through and it to be property repaired. inspection are two different issues. So you're, gonna, you're, are right. you talking about, you're not so you don't ask for a contingency on your home inspection. Is that what you're if, saying? If my if my clients want to go in with that kind of strain strain of a contract offer, yes, no inspect, no contingency. We're still going to have the inspection. But so the results the of the ins- for informational purposes only. Yes. And and on the front end, when you go in, writing into the offer. Buyer will request no repairs, but then you got to watch. Other gonna... than anything noted by the inspector as being a walkthrough item. Correct. So, it, so there we go back to say what you mean exactly, and mean what you say when you're putting together the offer to put it in front of the seller so that come walkthrough, there's no surprises because nobody likes surprises whether you're the buyer or the seller because they usually don't turn out well. Yeah, I, well, from what I'm seeing the contracts come through the, our office is as is doesn't really mean anything anymore. It, it's kind of like a joke. You might as well just go ahead and let them have the inspection and ask for repairs. Correct. And then remember, in there, there's always the right to terminate and release. If you see a water faucet in the kitchen that's leaking, if that hasn't been addressed, they can release for any reason at all. Well, we seem to forget that that sellers can just say no. Right. Okay. We, we're down to a minute before we have to take our commercial break. Uh, you're listening to the Real Estate PB and JR. This is Paul Fuquay. I have Kim Pimento and Bob Freck. Uh, we're here to belabor uh, many aspects of a contract. In, uh, and hopefully you'll return to us uh, or call us at 757-497-1310. Now back to the Real Estate PB&J Hour on Money Talk 1310 and 100.9 FM. Rosenwomble Realtor Paul Fuquay gives you the fundamentals of real estate selling, buying, owning, and improving your home. Okay, we, this is Paul Fuquay uh, with Rosenwomble Realty. You're on listening to uh, uh, Money Talk 1310 AM and 100.9 FM. You can also uh, listen to us on the computer. We're streaming live at moneytalk1310.com. And we can be reached by phone at 757-497-1310. If you ha- want to hear this again, uh, Please go to the Real Estate PB and J Hour on YouTube and subscribe. Uh, it costs you nothing, and you've got 25 programs to listen to our blather. Um, and so, I think just summarizing before the, the break, I think we're kind of all on the same page of music that the property inspections are important for the buyer to to get a good handle on yes. the condition of the property, how it's written in the offer, and how the buyer is going to respond. Those very, I mean, just during the break, the three of us talking have slightly different ways that we might write that up to, con- to communicate with the seller. If you, if you don't write it uh, and, and you, properly, and it can be in different forms, the language is, is, of course, interpretive, but if you don't write it to, to achieve your purpose, then you've put your client at a disadvantage, and you've also muddied the waters. Now, and there's a big, don't, don't make gray areas right. in an offer when... Just make sure it's written, so you're not I, writing. Gray I gotta areas move you guys it. on. I want to. <laughs> okay. How extensively should the home buyer review the condominium association documents or the homeowners association documents? Very extensively. And one of the things they need to look at is the budget. Any upcoming assessments? Is there any violations? I've had more violations lately come across uh, my desk, and uh, you have to go back and make the condo association make good of them or for the seller to make good before you close. So you have to remember that those violations go with the property. So if the seller doesn't correct them, 
and they are the seller's responsibility, they come on to the new buyer. So I think that's very important. And that's, that's I'll give you an example of a, a, a very popular neighborhood. Make in, this short because we're running out of okay. time. In oh, Hampton yeah. Roads, okay, it's a waterfront community. Um, it all sorts of different style houses, single family and stuff. Uh, the community has a community only boat ramp and dock. It's a beautiful one. Okay, and so when you're in that community and driving around and your buyer's agent takes you by that and you have a boat and you're going, well, this is a perfect place for me to live because I don't have to take my boat down to wherever to put it in the water. They've got one right here in the neighborhood. When you look in the owner's association documents, what's in those documents very clearly is you can have a boat on a trailer, but it cannot be visible from outside the house. So if you're thinking of parking your boat and trailer in your driveway, not going to happen. And it, when you go through this community and you see people that have boats and trailers and they raise their two-car garage door up, guess where some of those boats and trailers are? They're caddy corner inside that garage. So they've got their boat and their trailer at the house. They can use the community boat ramp and dock that they're paying for, but nobody can see the boat on the outside of the house when that garage door is closed. And that you don't know until you read the documents. Yeah, you have to, especially the rules and regulations. There's a lot of dog restrictions that people don't know that they have, and all of a sudden, you know, especially they have in a condos yeah. and, and stuff like that, condominiums and stuff. You can you can have some severe restrictions on pets. Right. Yeah. Correct. So I think that you need to you need to read it. You need to read the budget. And you need to read the bylaws and the rules and the upcoming assessments. Just realize, folks, that the standard under the, the Virginia law is, one, you as a buyer cannot waive this. It's required. Correct. You have to. You correct. have to sign, acknowledge receipt when it's presented to you. That receipt of the documents. Yes, yes receipt of the correct. documents. From that point on, you have three a three-day period for exercising your right of rescission, which means you can walk away. Correct. And I no lost penalty. a sale in, in a condominium development because the my buyer didn't like the fact that she couldn't plant her roses and tend, and tend for them in her front yard be, without the approval of the Condominium Correct. Owners Association, and they had say over what rose, roses she could put in. Correct. And and there said, are, there I'm are, not doing this. There are communities like that that are very strict on what yeah. kind of plants and stuff. Decorations. Um, and, and everything. And, and by the way, when Paul referred to three days, in our contracts whenever the reference is to days it is always calendar days and calendar days includes saturdays sundays and holidays so yes you could uh, a deadline could expire on a july 4th if you started back in, on friday with the time clock ticking so you've got to be real careful on days versus business days. Right, and it starts the next day. So if you received your docs today, it starts tomorrow. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday at 11.59 p.m., you would have to say make, a decision. make a decision. But, you know, or you'd be a squirrel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, you two, what is uh, it, well, my question is phrased. Uh, there's in the purchase agreement that we all use, there is on page 15, the items to convey and there are a whole bunch of things there for checkoff. How critical are these? And what do you do about things that you may want that aren't on the list? Uh, Kim? Um, it's very critical. I think you need to very much say, state exactly what you want. Some of the things that we were talking about earlier is the bathroom mirrors. Now, if it's bolted to the wall, okay, I, I would think that's attached. It has to be attached to the property. But if it's a beautiful mirror hung, the, technically, the uh, sellers could take that. So just remember that. So you need to put in there specifically decorative mirror and hall bathroom to, to convey. And the other thing that I see is people forget to put in their contracts is you want that fancy swimming pool cleaning that shark that you plug into the wall and put into your put into your pool and it nicely cleans your pool. Well, I've seen sellers walk away with those because they're quite expensive. And if they have a pool at their new house, they're going to take it. And so it's because it wasn't asked for in writing. In the contract. Clearly in writing on the offer. Remember, folks, we, we, you, you'll hear the term offer in contract. It's always an offer until 
all the terms of the contract have been agreed to. Not when inspections have been done, but when buyer and seller has agreed to all the terms in the contract and the last initial, the last signature is on the offer, it now becomes a contract. Correct. Yeah, and it's not fully executed till you close. So if there's things, uh, let me tell you a personal a personal story, and it cost me. It was many years ago. I had I had the seller, um, and they had uh, two garage door openers in the uh, in the garage, and the offer came through. I was a young agent. Offer came through, and it said garage door openers and remotes. That's the way it was written up, and I just you know, I, you know we we rat we we negotiated it, we agreed it, we ratified it, walked through, the buyer showed up, I was there on behalf of the seller, and my sellers were there, buyer showed up, and the buyer's agent came up to me and said, hey, Bob, where are the garage door opener remotes? And I went, hold on for a second, and I went back to my seller, and I said, hey, I need the garage door opener remotes, and the seller looked at me and said, we don't have any, and we've never had any. Who said we had remotes? Well, Bob went out and bought two remotes to get this thing to the closing table and stuff. So you, when it comes to these items that convey the outdoor furniture that's sitting out there, if your buyer wants it, it needs to go into the offer. Now, flip that over, and if you're competing with another offer and they don't ask for this stuff, so you, you get into a real chess game as you're trying to construct your offer and going, is it really important that you get this outdoor furniture? Because it could be the tipping point to where the other offer gets taken instead of yours. Yes, I agree. You have to be very, very specific about what you want, what you don't want. So we can go to the next one, Paul? Or? Yeah, I, people ask me all the time, well, what's all this thing, especially people from outside our area who aren't yet familiar with jet noise and jet crashes and things of that nature, <laughs> what's this aircraft noise and accident potential zone all about? <laughs> sound of freedom. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I had a you know, uh, sound effect is important. Uh, uh, no, it's not. It's, <laughs> <laughs> there are people who live in areas that which are impacted by jet noise. Huge. Okay, yeah. and there is an obligation for a seller to disclose where on the maps the house is located. We call them charts, but you can call them a map if it's you a, want. Look, <laughs> I drive places. I don't fly places. <laughs> okay. now, now, I will also tell you that those there are certain areas of Chesapeake and Virginia Beach which are impacted by the noise zone in terms of allowing or disallowing development. I happen to have a piece of property in Pungo that's beautiful on the water that has a very, very limited building envelope because the rest of the property is in a 70 to 75 noise zone. Correct. And when BRAC was going to close down the master jet base, the city panicked and said, oh, okay, no, we won't allow any development where there's 70 to 75. Now, this place is... Now, 70 to 75 is, is, is a fancy way of saying different noise levels, yeah. but we almost, you're right, Oceana almost got closed down by the BRAC Commission because builders were encroaching on the high noise zones and crash zones yes. for the Oceana. Zones, right? Pardon? In the clear zones. You want oh, to my get, gosh, yeah, and, yeah. and stuff, and, and it, it almost cost us Oceana and, and the master jet base because of that. But tell us tell us the definitions. What's a clear zone? Clear zone is you don't you stay out of it because that's the highest accident zone and it it doesn't matter whether it's Oceana doesn't matter whether it's NAS Norfolk or Norfolk International uh, all those things are you stay out of it and that clear is always such a I think such a strange word to call that to me it's like hazard zone or something <laughs> correct well it, it meant keep the damn place clear correct yeah. <laughs> and, and the noise zones i mean you can you know sometimes you Less look than up 65 remember these are dba ratings that are over a 24-hour period and it's the average correct but when you're in 70 to 75 it means in a 24-hour period they take a measurement of that property at that property it's going to average over that period correct. of time a, a level of a noise of 70 to 75 dB. And we know neighborhoods in Hampton Roads where if you're in those and the and the hornets are up there flying and doing their touch and goes and all this kind of stuff, you can't talk outside. You have to stop talking. It's the sound of freedom. Yes, it and is. It's, uh, but, but, you, but as a buyer, first of all, the seller has to disclose the noise and accident zone, and a buyer needs to understand what that is, and especially if they're coming from outside the area. All right, folks. 
we're coming down. Do you have anything to add real quick, Kim? Because we've got one three-minute segment left. No, I just say, hey, this is Kim Pimento. I'm in the Green Bar office of Rose and Womble, and I really enjoy working there. And if you don't like where you live, move. You're not a tree. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. another text. And uh, Bob Freck, you want to give a... You, yeah, and of course, my wife's uh, on poetry the book on the 16th of July. She's going to have her uh, book signing right. and, and stuff at the, at the Muse Writers uh, Center on Colonial in Norfolk. Four o'clock in the afternoon, come on by. The the the, um, the author will be there signing. I will be signing. in Washington, D.C. Sorry. And, and, well, I, 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 okay, I'll sign yours then for you when you come back. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope Deborah would. Anyway, okay. It might okay. not be worth much, Listen. but oh, <laughs> Folks, we appreciate your listening to us. Uh, sometimes we prattle on, sometimes we don't. But there are little there are nuggets of gold uh, information in, in what we've said. You can go to the YouTube uh, channel, uh, which is the Real Estate PB and J Hour on YouTube. Subscribe, listen. Uh, the great part of it is you can turn it off. That's the, that's what I like about being radio. One, I don't have anybody directly in front of me um, arguing a point other than Kim and, and, and Bob. Bob. <laughs> so I'm, I'm regretting. That's why we're here. Sometimes I regret asking Bob to be on the show. He <laughs> loves a, it. He it, really does. Yeah, yeah. I love the man. He's phenomenal. Anyway. Anyway, uh, just to recap, we'll be back next Thursday, um, and it's at 5 o'clock here on uh, whatever this is, Money Talk 13, 10 a.m., 100.9 FM, uh, and on the Chevy, uh, Chevy, there I do it again, you Car Guy, last week car, car guy in Me comes out. Yeah, you did. That, uh, you know, it's a big weekend for cars. As a matter of fact, tomorrow is National Collector Car Appreciation Day. Oh. As... It, it memorialized by the United States Congress. So my 2004 Hyundai Sonata no, with 300,000 miles. No, your must. Uh, no, you don't have a must. You have a yeah, Mustang. my 65 Mustang okay. convertible. See, that, yeah, yeah. Do you ever show it? And bring it to parades or anything? Uh, no, I don't. Uh-huh. I can't get it out of my yard. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those. It's not a lo- no longer a, 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 a collector's truck. item. It requires it's an a tow, item Yeah, it requires a tow truck. Okay. This is Paul Fuquay. Um, thank you for listening to us. You're, it's been a pleasure. Uh, you can reach us next week at uh, 757-497-1310. We're on the air at 5 o'clock Thursdays here on Money Talk 1310 AM. Bye.